chapter 14, Concepts of Acid Base Balance and Imbalances. We are aware that acid and base balance is needed to maintain homeostasis with an arterial blood pH between 7.35 and 7.45. This regulation occurs through the movement of hydrogen ions and their ability to be produced and eliminated appropriately. Acid and base chemistry, we know that hydrogen ions are vital to life. Um, this is because hydrogen ions determine the pH of the body, which again, as we previously talked about on the um, first or second slide, this must be maintained in that normal range of 7.35 to 7.45 in order for cells, tissues, and organs to survive. Your hydrogen ion concentration is expressed in the pH scale, um, ranging from 1 to 14, with 7 being that most neutral position. The number of hydrogen ions in body fluid determine if um, there is acidity or acidosis um, or alkaline or alkalosis, or if we've achieved a neutral balance. Acids are produced as the end production of metabolism. Again, acids do contain hydrogen ions. Acids are considered hydrogen ion donors, so they will give up hydrogen ions to neutralize or decrease the strength of an acid. So therefore, we would see a decline in the pH scale with an increasing acidity. Bases, however, do not contain hydrogen ions. They will readily accept hydrogen ions um, from acids in order to neutralize um, or decrease the strength of a base to form a weaker acid. Now we will discuss homeostasis as it relates to acid and base balance. We've talked about this in chapter 13 regarding fluid and electrolyte balance. In order for homeostasis to be maintained, hydrogen ion productions must be consistent and not in excessive um, or limited um, excess. Your CO2 loss from the body through breathing must keep pace with all the form of this hydrogen ion production. Now we're going to talk about acid and base control actions via primary buffers. Um, the carbonic acid bicarbonate system, this is the ability to maintain a neutral pH of 7.4 with a ratio of 20 parts bicarbonate to one part carbonic acid. Your carbonic acid concentration is going to be controlled by the excretion of CO2 from the lungs. It's going to be dependent on the rate and depth of respirations in response to change in CO2 levels. Your kidneys will be um, in control of bicarbonate concentration. They will selectively retain or excrete bicarbonate in response to body needs and the ability to maintain homeostasis. The next acid-base control mechanism we will discuss is the respiratory system. During acidosis, the pH is going to decrease, um, your respiratory rate and depth increase in an attempt to exhale those excessive acids. Excessive acids are going to be carried to the lungs where it is reduced to CO2 um, and water and therefore um, released on exhale. These hydrogen ions are inactivated um, to allow for ease of exhale. During alkalosis, we see the opposite. We see a pH that is increasing, therefore respiratory rate and depth decrease, and CO2 is retained to try to help maintain a balance of our acid and bases. The lungs can hold hydrogen ions until this deficit is, correct, is corrected, or the possibility of these hydrogen ions being in inactivated um, and being changed to water molecules to be um, exhaled with CO2. So this correction um, this, uh, mechanism by your respiratory system takes 10 to 30 seconds, so very rapid response by your respiratory system um, in response to an acid and base imbalance, which we'll talk about is going to be opposite from our kidney response. 
Now we will discuss the kidneys, which are again slower to compensate compared to the lungs for an asthenin base imbalance, but are much more effective at this task. This is your third line of defense against pH changes. Usually takes 24 to 48 hours to respond. This is um, completed by the kidneys by allowing for movement of bicarb that's either produced elsewhere in the body and bicarb that's produced in the kidneys um, to be excreted in the urine or reabsorbed in the presence of acidosis. So when blood hydrogen ion levels are high, the bicarbonate is reabsorbed from the kidneys back into circulation where it can help buffer excessive hydrogen ions. The kidney tubules can also make additional bicarbonate and reabsorb it to increase this buffer effect. When blood hydrogen ions are low, you will see that the bicarbonate stays in the urine and is excreted. Let's talk here about the role of potassium in relation to acid base imbalances um, and signs and symptoms and treatment as it relates to what we discussed in chapter 13. So the body changes the potassium levels by drawing hydrogen ions into cells or pushing them out of cells based on um, whether we are in alkalosis or acidotic state. During acidosis, the body's going to protect itself from the acid state and move these excessive hydrogen ions into the cells, so from extracellular into intracellular positions of the hydrogen ions. Therefore, potassium is then going to be pushed out of the intracellular space into vascular cir circulation to maintain an electrolyte balance, and potassium is therefore going to increase. So in an acidosis state, um, your patient will likely um, experience a change in their potassium levels. During um, alkalosis, the cells release hydrogen ions into the blood in an attempt to increase the acidity. This is going to force the potassium into the cells and your potassium level decreases. So therefore, your patient may experience signs and symptoms of hypokalemia when in an alkalosis state. So compensation um, occurs via the respiratory and kidney systems as we've discussed on previous slides. In the body's attempt to correct acute changes in blood pH um, pH levels less than 6.9 or greater than 7.8 are usually fatal. So it's very important that these compensation mechanisms are um, working appropriately. If not, we're going to move on to talk about these acid base imbalances in hopes of you being able to recognize these um, signs and symptoms in your patient, um, then develop a plan of action, possible um, hypothesis and reason for this, and then move into appropriate interventions and evaluating outcomes to prevent the fatality risk. Okay, remember that it's kind of a seesaw pattern between the kidneys and the lungs in an attempt to correct changes in blood pH and maintain an acid and base balance and that a pH level below 6.9 or above 7.4 is usually fatal for patients, and that the respiratory system is more sensitive, can compensate quickly, however efforts are limited and usually respiratory system is easily overwhelmed. The kidneys are more powerful, but they're usually later to the game, later to respond, um, but can lead to a rapid um, changes in extracellular fluid composition, but not triggered until that imbalance has been present for several hours to seven days. When adaptive actions by the kidneys or lungs are completely effective and we have full compensation of acid based problems, this means that that pH of the blood has returned to normal even though the levels of um, CO2 and bicarb are, um, may not be normal. Sometimes the acid and base balance is so severe that the compensation action of the kidneys or lungs can only partially compensate and therefore the pH is not quite in the normal range. Partial compensation is valuable though because it's preventing the um, imbalance from becoming even more severe which is going to impact um, cellular 
um, homeostasis. So lungs compensate for kidneys and kidneys compensate for lungs. Um, it's very important that you understand the ranges of the ABG values. We talked about this in your fundamentals lecture is also listed in the laboratory profile of this chapter. But you need to know what makes an ABG um, acidotic or alkalotic, how to determine if it's respiratory or metabolic, and then we're going to go through some causes of each throughout this lecture related to is it respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis. And it's important to remember that neither the acidosis or alkalosis state is the um, actual disease or disorder, um, but it's a condition. It's a condition resulting from an acute or chronic health problem that's disrupting or overwhelming our balancing mechanism. We always have to address this problem in order to correct the acid and base imbalance. Again, your problem of origin um, can not only be respiratory or metabolic, but can also be both if you have um, failing mechanisms or disorders that are impairing them. Remember that your pH function indicator is the PaCO2. In a respiratory imbalance, you will find an opposite, remember Rome, opposite relationship between the pH and um, PaCO2. Um, so in other words, the pH will be elevated with a decreased PaCO2 alkalosis, or the pH will be decreased with an elevated PaCO2 indicating the acidosis. You want to look at that pH and the PaCO2 to determine whether this is a respiratory problem. Um, and then remember that the metabolic function indicator is the bicarb. So in a metabolic imbalance, there is corresponding relationships as well between the pH um, and bicarbonate. Um, but this in that realm is mean equal and those arrows are in the same direction. So your pH will be elevated and you would find if this was a metabolic um, imbalance that your bicarbonate will be elevated or the pH will be decreased and your bicarbonate ions will be decreased indicating um, acidosis. This slide reviews um, ABG interpretation. So looking at the pH first, you'll identify if that pH is elevated or um, decreased outside of normal range. If it's elevated, it is indicating alkalosis. If it's decreased, it's indicating acidosis. Moving on to step two, you'll then look at the PaCO2, determine if it's elevated or decreased. If it reflects an opposite relationship compared to your pH, remembering Rome, this means a respiratory imbalance. If it does not indicate an opposite relationship, but one that is equal or arrows in the same direction, um, this is when we have to go on to pyramid step three to look at our um, bicarbonate levels. So does your bicarbonate levels reflect that corresponding relationship with pH? If so, then this is a metabolic imbalance. And then pyramid step four um, is going to have you address whether or not compensation has occurred. So full compensation has occurred if that pH has returned to the normal range of 7.35 to 7.45. If the pH is not within the normal range, um, we want to look back at those respiratory or metabolic indicators. If it's a respiratory imbalance, look at the bicarbonate to determine the state of compensation. Um, if it is a condition in which there is a metabolic imbalance, you want to look at the PaCO2 to determine um, if there has been compensation by um, the, rest, the kidneys. Now we're going to dig a little bit deeper and begin to talk about respiratory and metabolic acidosis or alkalosis states, acid and base imbalances in relation to patient care, nursing interventions, um, and our expectations for evaluation. Now with your um, acidotic state, we know that we have excessive presence of hydrogen ions, our pH 
is below 7.35. Always remember this is not a disease, it is a condition. And when you determine the disease disorder risk factor that's putting this patient at risk for this acid and base imbalance, greatest risk for those patients with breathing problems and older adults with chronic health problems that impair the ability of the respiratory um, or kidney compensation. Metabolic acidosis, this is due to an overproduction and or under elimination of hydrogen ions or bicarbonate ions. So overproduction of hydrogen ions occurs when excessive breakdown of fatty acids occur, um, limiting to free hydrogen ions being present. A uh, disorder we typically associate this with is diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, we'll talk about this in an upcoming module in 1940. So diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, is a serious condition that can lead to diabetic coma or even death. So when your cells are not getting enough glucose, um, they still need energy um, to perform their function, maintain homeostasis. So therefore, your body and your cells are going to begin to burn fat for energy. The byproduct of this is ketones. Um, a serious diabetic complication occurs when the body produces excessive amounts of the, key, of the ketones because they are... Um, uh, have a higher presence of hydrogen ions, so this is creating a rich hydrogen hydrogen ion environment or acidotic state. This typically occurs when there's um, not enough insulin present in our body. Remember that's a, um, or I like to remember it as a lock and key mechanism that allows us to utilize the glucose um, that we take in. So if that insulin's not present, then we can't properly utilize the um, glucose that is available in our bloodstream. It can also be triggered by um, infections and illnesses. Symptoms will include um, thirst, frequent urination, nausea, abdominal pain, weakness, um, a fruity scented breath, and then usually acute confusion or mental status changes. Hospital treatment is required um, to replace these fluids, monitor for electrolyte abnormalities, and then usually provide um, initially an IV insulin um, drip to begin to reverse the effects of this acidotic state. So with the metabolic acidosis, we know we need more presence of a base. So this can be done with the utilization of a medication called sodium bicarb. Um, there's also a presentation that may cause metabolic acidosis with under elimination of hydrogen ions. This is where hydrogen ions are produced at a normal rate, but unfortunately are not removed at the same rate that they are produced. Um, you should be thinking most commonly this is due to severe lung impairment, such as that would cause retention of CO2, and then kidney failure that would cause retention of hydrogen ions. Um, another situation that would lead to metabolic acidosis is underproduction of bicarb to buffer hydrogen ions, which can lead to acidosis when too few bicarbs are present to balance the hydrogen ions. Bicarb is made um, in the kidneys, as we already talked about, so therefore um, kidney failure and impairment of liver or pancreatic function can also cause base, base um, deficit acidosis. Always remember that over-elimination of bicarb um, can occur when too much bicarb has been lost, commonly due to diarrhea, intestinal and pancreatic secretions, um, excessive loss of that of the base in this situation is leading to acidosis. Respiratory acidosis results when respiratory function is impaired and the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide is reduced. This is going to lead to retention of CO2 and increase in hydrogen ions. Respiratory depression um, causes retention of CO2 from depressed function of the brainstem. That's going to trigger um, bre uh, breathing movement. So lowering our rate and depth of breathing is going to lead to poor gas exchange and retention of CO2. This can occur when the neurons of the brainstem are damaged by trauma um, or experiencing increased cranial pressure. Another reason for a retention of CO2 is an adequate chest expansion. 
This can um, be restricted internally by skeletal muscle or respiratory muscle weakness. Obesity can also restrict chest movement. Airway obstruction um, is going to prevent air movement in and out of the lungs and retention of CO2. And reduction of alveolar um, capillary diffusion is going to lead to poor gas exchange and carbon dioxide retention. Um, this poor gas exchange um, due to the reduction of alveolar capillary diffusion can be due to pneumonia, tuberculosis, emphysema, acute respiratory stress syndrome or ARDS, chest trauma, PE or pulmonary embolism, pulmonary edema, and drowning. There are some common risks listed there in table 14.3 on page 277 that you need to be familiar with. This again is going to re review impaired um, breathing due to asthma. With asthma, you have spasms um, that's going to result from allergens, irritants, even um, ele elevated emotions causes the smooth muscle of your bronchioles to constrict, resulting in effective gas exchange, you have atelectasis, which can be due to excessive collection of mucus within the collapse of the alveolar sac caused by mucus plugs, infection or drainage. Bronchitis is inflammation um, that can lead to airway obstruction. Um, emphysema and COPD is loss of that elasticity of the alveolar sacs, which is going to restrict airflow in and out and lead to CO2 um, retention as well. Your pulmonary edema is going to um, lead to accumulation of fluid and pulmonary tissue. This is going to disturb the ability of proper alveolar diffusion and perfusion. And then a PE, we have um, an embolus that's going to cause obstruction in a pulmonary artery, leading to airway obstruction and inadequate gas exchange. You'll see seizures listed there as a risk factor. Um, after a, a client has experienced like a tonic-clonic seizure, their ABG would likely demonstrate respiratory acidosis with the low PO2. Um, priority here is usually to apply um, some oxygen to support them because after this seizure has resolved, we'll um, see the ability of the client to resolve that CO retention with adequate um, breathing. It's during the seizure activity is when they're going to experience the impaired gas exchange um, leading to poor oxygenation CO retention. But again, after that seizure um, is finished, their breathing is going to return to normal again. Um, so administering the oxygen will increase that PaO2. Other causes we've talked about um, are also listed in that box. Unfortunately, metabolic and respiratory acidosis can occur at the same time. This is going to impair the ability for compensation. An example of this is diabetic ketoacidosis with a patient experiencing metabolic acidosis and then also has acute exacerbation of COPD, which would lead to respiratory acidosis. As you can imagine, this would be more severe than just one type of acidosis alone due to the inability to compensate. So what cues are we going to recognize in our patient um, who is experiencing acidosis? Again, remember this is a condition, not a disorder or disease itself. We have to identify that disease or disorder that's predisposing um, them to um, an acidic environment. So your key features box, that's um, box 14.1 on page 279. And you also want to be familiar with the critical rescue box on page 278. We must prioritize assessment of the cardiovascular function of our client with acidosis. Typically early cardiovascular changes include increased heart rate um, and cardiac output. Unfortunately, just as we talked about with electrolyte imbalances, um, our heart can only keep up this tolerance of increased heart rate and cardiac output for a short period of time before that muscle gets weak and tired. So as the acidosis worsens and we're experiencing some hyperkalemia with this, 
you're going to see the heart rate is going to fall. Um, T waves on your EKG will come peaked and tall, and I'll demonstrate this um, in class. And then um, likely hypotension with um, vasodilation as a result of the acidosis, um, inability to find those peripheral pulses that are indicating adequate perfusion to extremities. So your patient is not going to have um, vital perfusion of oxygen and nutrition um, to target cells and organs. Reviewing the um, acidotic key features box on page 279, we talked about the cardiovascular signs and symptoms that you would expect on the previous slide. Also, we'll note usually um, CNS depression, decreased steep tendon reflexes, skeletal muscle weakness. Respiratory signs and symptoms will include Kuzmal's respirations. If this um, is due to metabolic acidosis, this is deep, rapid. Um, respirations um, with an attempt for your respiratory system to compromise for that metabolic acidosis. And then um, your skin assessment is going to depend on the type of uh, um, acidosis your client is experiencing. It will be warm, flushed, and dry in metabolic acidosis, and then typically pale um, to cyanotic and dry skin with respiratory acidosis. It's important that you are familiar with how to interpret an ABG to identify blood gas, sorry, to um, identify an acid and base imbalance. So looking at box 14.2 on page 279, you see that outline for metabolic acidosis. You'll see that the pH is low because, because buffering and the respiratory compensation are not adequate usually to keep the amount of free ions at normal levels. Your bicarb level is usually less than 21 because bicarb has been lost or its production is inadequate. Um, distinguishing metabolic acidosis, again, is usually that pH below 7.35 and a normal partial pressure of your arterial ox oxygen or that PaO2. As oxygen intake is unimpaired, um, usually occurs together with a normal or slightly low partial pressure of um, arterial carbon dioxide, that PaCO2, um, as ventilation is not impaired but may be um, low because the respiratory system is attempting, attempting to compensate. Respiratory acidosis, um, ABG values as demonstrated on the key features box 14.3 on page 280 of your text. Typically here, um, kidney compensation is not enough to keep pH in a normal range. Your partial pressure of oxygen is um, typically low, indicating greatly reduced gas exchange and adequate oxygenation. Partial pressure of arterial CO2 is high because the pulmonary problem is impairing gas exchange, causing poor oxygenation and leading to CO retention. Um, patients with rapid onset of respiratory acidosis will typically have a normal bicarb. You should know the reason for this. We've talked about it um, earlier in this recording. This is because the kidney compensation has not started. Remember, it's typically greater than 24 hours before we will see the kidneys compensate with an increase in bicarbonate levels. Remember, acidosis is a symptom of another health problem. We must first focus on identifying the type of acidosis present. But knowing this is a condition, we, that will then assist us in determining common causes, risk factors, disease or disorder that our client is experiencing or has experienced this causing or has led to this acid base imbalance. Metabolic acidosis. Usually, um, aim of treatment is hydration and drugs to control the problem, again, causing the metabolic acidosis. If this is due to um, DKA, insulin, as we talked about before, is given to correct that hyperglycemia and halt the production of the keto antibodies, which is contributing to the um, acidosis. Typically, your patient will also be um, given K riders, potassium replacement here during this insulin infusion. Focus on rehydration and antidiarrheals if this is due to excessive diarrhea. You will see utilization of bi um, bicarbonate supplements. 
usually if that pH begins to fall less than 7.2 because we know that um, that's closer or increasing our patient's risk um, of, of death due to an acidic environment and also demonstrating that compensation may not be happening or may be inadequate. So loss of bicarb due to diarrhea is, is very common reason with the pH less than 7.2 that your patient may be receiving bicarb to help restore homeostasis. Do not forget the prioritization of your cardiac assessment because it is very sensitive, sensitive to respiratory or metabolic acidosis. Respiratory acidosis, um, we will prioritize improving gas exchange. Again, as we're gonna see um, a decline in that partial pressure of oxygen saturation. COPD is one of the most common problems associated with respiratory acidosis. We therefore must prioritize monitoring of breathing status um, with our lung and airway assessment, any use of accessory muscles. We'll discuss later in this chapter um, COPD, but management is typically focused on drug therapy, such as bronchodilators, oxygen therapy with the lowest flow rate needed to prevent hypoxemia, and then mechanical ventilation may be needed in our patients experiencing acute exacerbations. Your oxygen therapy is going to help promote gas exchange. Um, your patient, again, may need ventilation support um, who cannot keep their oxygen saturation um, at 90% or greater or experiencing that rest, respiratory muscle fatigue, that di diaphragm fatigue. It may be possible that you um, are caring acutely for a patient who experienced an opioid overdose. Um, they are going to demonstrate hypoventilation due to suppression of the brain respiratory system from that opioid overdose. So priority here is to improve gas exchange. So assisting with intubation and ventilation. Preventing complications is a nursing priority when caring with patients with respiratory acidosis. Um, you want to make um, prioritization that you monitor respiratory status um, at least hourly, making sure your interventions are prompt when you note these acute changes. This is critical in preventing um, the progression of the acid and base balance. You wanna to listen to breath sounds, assess how easily air is moving in and out, and if that has changed since your last assessment. Check for muscle retractions, use of accessory muscles, or note of a grunt um, or wheezing. Also prioritizing your cardiac um, assessment still, because we know that the cardiac and skeletal muscle systems are sensitive to acidosis, just as I stated um, on the previous slide. And then always looking to identify the cause. So if your um, patient may be experiencing this um, acid and base imbalance from alkalosis, um, we will talk about that in the upcoming slides. So evaluating outcomes with our patient who is experiencing acidosis, how will we monitor for improvement? Interpreting ongoing ABG results, determine if our client is responding to treatment or are they worsening. You want to prioritize that cardiovascular and skeletal muscle systems because we've already talked about how sensitive these systems are to acidosis. So with progressive skeletal muscle weakness, if our, if our client's acidosis is worsening, we know this can lead to severe respiratory insufficiency due to diaphragm weakness. So you would want to prioritize your rate, rhythm, and depth assessment of respiration. Your worsening acidosis could also lead to hyperkalemia due to the compensation of our body by shifting the extracellular hydrogen ions intracellularly. That's um, gonna cause our cells to push those hydrogen ions, sorry, those potassium ions into vascular cir circulation to keep a neutral charge. And therefore our patient will may demonstrate some complications of hyperkalemia like cardiac dysrhythmia. So we want to make sure our patient is on a cardiac monitor. We will review the next few slides of the clinical judgment model in class together. But if you'd like to be prepared early, you can go ahead and read 
um, the client presentation or scenario presented here and begin to answer the questions that are listed on each slide. Now moving on to alkalosis, this can result from actual relative increase in the amount of bases, um, usually in the relationship of bicarb when it is either overproduced or under eliminated. Metabolic alkalosis um, is an ABG result with an elevated pH and elevated bicarbonate level, along with a normal oxygen and normal um, carbon dioxide levels. You'll see the common causes of metabolic alkalosis on page 282 of your text on um, table 14.5. This can be to increase um, intake of base components, mostly coming from oral and acids and then decrease of acid components, which can be due to the prolonged vomiting, um, NG tube suctioning, or use of these loop and thiazide diuretics, usually in, in the form of um, higher doses than would be therapeutic for your patient. Respiratory alkalosis, this is an ABG result with an elevated pH but it's gonna um, demonstrate a low carbon dioxide level. Usually the oxygen and bicarbonate levels are normal. Your risk factors are listed in that same box on um, page 282, table 14.5. Um, CO2 um, loss through hyperventilation, um, need to be thinking about anxiety, fear, our patients breathing all, uh, off too much CO2, could be due to improper settings on mechanical ventilators or um, fevered attempt to irregulate here. But if our patient is experiencing excessive anxiety and fear, we need to try to help them identify um, through therapeutic communication what the cause may be, how we can provide assistance here. Um, you may see ways we can lower that anxiety and, and stress or may have them um, rebreathe um, in a paper bag as well. Asthma exacerbation, your patient here is air hungry, so they're um, hyperventilating and losing um, all their CO2 in that scenario. So what are we gonna see um, or we're gonna recognize in our patient who we're concerned may be experiencing alkalosis? Um, symptoms typically are a result of hypokalemia and hypocalcemia, so low potassium and calcium levels. Your key features are listed in box 14.4 on page 283. You will note a positive Chabox and Trousseau sign in relation to hypokalemia, along with muscle cramps, twitching, um, your deep tendon reflexes are hyperactive, um, skeletal muscles, you see inappropriate um, contractions as a result of overstimulation of nerves, um, but then they become weak um, because of the persistence and the evidence of the hyperkalemia. You'll see hand grip de-strength, um, may be able, unable to walk or stand, and we'll talk about whenever we note that. We always have to prioritize safety and reduce risk of injuries and falls. Your respiratory efforts are going to become less effective due to respiratory muscle weakness, diaphragm weakness. Um, you're going to see elevations in heart rate, but usually palpation of that pulse is difficult. It feels thready and weak, and patient experiences hypotension. Just as with acidosis, with alkalosis, our interventions um, are prioritized on identifying the cause of the acid and base imbalance. We need to prevent further loss of hydrogen ions, prevent further loss of potassium and calcium, and restore fluid balance. Again, if this is due to anxiety or fear, um, we can assess through therapeutic communication, how can we help? And again, may assist that client with breathing into a paper bag to increase carbon dioxide retention, also can help them ease anxiety. Always prioritizing patient safety as risk for falls in light of hypotension and muscle weakness. Treatments that 
may have caused this, such as the prolonged gastric suctioning or, or prolonged vomiting. Um, you may see um, that those interventions are stopped or reduced or we're giving um, anti-emetics and things like that to help with the vomiting. Monitoring electrolytes closely until they return to that normal range. Um, always prioritizing, again, that prevention of injury from falls making sure we have fall precautions in place, advising them to make position changes slowly and dangle their legs um, um, along the bedside before taking that um, first initiation to stand.